Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fifth Sums Up webinar for European mobility practitioners. And this webinar is organized as a part of learning activities that we organized to offer information and support for implementing SUMBs among the local authorities in Europe. And first, I will go through a bit technicalities for the webinar. So you can either dial in by computer or phone. And then you are all muted now during the webinar, but if you want to speak and ask questions, you can raise your hand. But you can also insert questions through the questions box there, and you can also do during that present during the pr different presentations. And we will have in the end of the webinar, we will have this joint question and answer session. So then we will ask all the questions that you have asked. So remember already during the presentation so that you actually remember your questions. And then we also have a couple of polls where we ask different questions and then you can just select the answer that is suitable for you. Uh, first bit about Civitas Thumbs Up project. So the aim of the Civitas Thumbs Up is to offer training and capacity building to European local authorities and mobility practitioners and support the take up of SUMBs in different cities. So SAMSAP has offered these learning activities. We have organized webinars and e-courses and also workshops. And also the project has developed several guides and guidelines that help cities to prepare SUMPs. And we have also, our project has also coordinated the revision of the European SUMP guideline, which is the topic today. And in, in the webinar, we have three presenters and I will moderate the webinar. So we have Lasse Brandt from Ruprecht Consult, Matilde Tinelata from Eurocities and Thomas Murray from Polis. So they will give you the presentations. And first we will start with the introduction to the SUMP guidelines, the second edition of the guidelines. Then we will have also introductions to two topic guidelines that are complementary guidelines to the SUMP guidelines. So we will hear about the sustainable urban mobility planning for metropolitan areas, as well as electrification in sustainable urban mobility planning. And after that, we have the questions and answers. But before we actually start, we have a couple of polls. We would like to know a bit more about where you are from. So you can now select the correct answer. Still some votes are coming. Almost 100% voted. Okay, let's close and then we will share the results. So now you can share that 39%, 3% city administration, but then we also have, have people representing planning authorities at regional and national level as, as well as representing civil society and private sectors and also some others. Then we also have a second poll. So we would like to know how much you already know about the second edition of the SUMB guidelines, which will be presented today. Or also that whether SUMPs are a totally new topic for you. Some votes are still coming. Okay, let's close the poll and share the results. Okay, 
So only a couple of persons for whom SUMPs is a completely new topic and then most of you know the main idea of SUMPs but maybe have not read the guidelines or know the first edition and have only taken a look at the new guidelines. So this is now good that today you will hear about the second editions. But I will give floor now to Lasse who will present the second edition of the guidelines. So Lasse, if you can share your camera. Thank you for the introduction, Maya. And welcome to the webinar, everyone, also from my side. I will try to share my screen. Yes, we can see it. Are we? Now we can see it. Perfect. Okay, good. So, um, as Maya said, I am working for Rubrich Consult as an urban mobility expert. Um, and Rubrich Consult is the editor of the old as well as the new SMP guidelines. And here at the company, one of my main tasks in the last one and a half years has been to work on the update of the SMP guidelines. So I'm very happy to be able to present them to you today. And just before I start to manage your expectations, of course, I will not be able to describe every detail in the guidelines today, but I hope to give you a good overview and to make you interested to have a look at them and to read them yourself. So here are the five points that I will talk about in the next 30, 35 minutes. And thank you also, Maya, for doing the poll questions because that will help me to focus my presentation. Um, as I saw, there are, most of the people haven't had a closer or in-depth look at the new guidelines. So I think it works well that my plan is to, to give a relatively broad introduction. Um, but first I will start explaining why did we need an update in the first place? Why was this process started? Then I look at what is a sustainable urban mobility plan. So the basic elements of SEMP, which have stayed the same in the new guidelines. Then we look a little bit more at what has changed. We look in depth at the new cycle and how SCMP works in practice. As the fourth point, we look at the structure and the design of the document itself, how it can help you in your planning processes and how you can make best use of it. And then I will finish with an outlook into the future of SCMP. And as Maya also said, Feel free whenever you have questions, type them into the comment field and then we can discuss in the end. So why did we need an update? It wasn't only that the first edition of the guidelines was published six years ago in 2013, but in the meantime, there has been a lot of important changes that have an effect on how we plan in our cities today. Um, as most of you probably know, there is a longer European policy process that has established SUMP following a gradual shift in transport planning approaches, both in practice and in academia um, in the last decades, I would say. Um, on the European level, SUMP has been coined in 2013 mainly, where the European Commission published the urban mobility package, whose annex defines the concept of SUMP. And at the same time, the SMP guidelines were published, which give more detailed guidance on how to actually do it, which also included the SMP cycle. In the following years, we had a lot of different projects on SMP, a lot of support for cities, and not to forget the strongest argument maybe that more and more SMP is seen as a requirement or competitive advantage at least to attract EU funding. So. All of this together led to a mainstreaming of SEMP. A lot of cities in Europe and beyond developed such plans in recent years. I think we have over 1,000 SEMPs in Europe by now. So there was a wealth of practical experience gathered that needed to be integrated in the new guidelines. And also a lot of additional guiding materials from the different projects. 
So this was the one side, a lot of practical experience, but this, the other side of the coin is of course the new mobility developments. And there's been, as you all know, there's been rapid changes. Uh, digitalization, for example, almost everyone has a smartphone by now, which was definitely not the case in 2013 in all countries. And this smartphone is used to navigate the city, internet shopping and parcel delivery is exploding. And who would have thought six years ago that free floating e-scooters are probably the most hotly debated transport issue of today. So this offers new challenges, as we all know, but also no new opportunities and not also in the way we move around and which mode of transport we use, but also for the way we plan. New options have appeared such as app-based data collection, also online citizen participation has become much more realistic or things such as automatic number plate reading to detect illegal parking. There's a wide range of things cities can do now that they couldn't do in 2013. And in order to reflect these new realities, the SUMP guidelines have been updated. In the last one to two years, there has been a very broad consultation process with Europe's urban mobility stakeholders. And this all started with a big feedback session at the SUMP conference 2018 in Nicosia. Um, afterwards, the different city networks that are involved in our project sums up, ECLE, POLIS, and Eurocities. They each organized sessions with their members. We had an in-depth two-day planning workshop with a selected group of experts from all over Europe. Um, and then, of course, we had the final SUMP conference in Groningen this year, where we presented the draft text in two sessions and where we again collected a lot of feedback that helped us to further improve the draft. So in total, we collected a lot of feedback from more than 300 practitioners, which helped us to, to summarize the state of the art in strategic mobility planning in the new document. And of course, to make sure that we are not presenting something that is too theoretical, but that is really closely connected how, to how cities actually plan and practice. Um, as you can imagine, there are it was a lot of work to put all of this together in one comprehensive document that still has a nice red thread and reads well. So as here on the slide, for example, you see on the top right, the feedback wall and the last to do's for the document in September. And I would like to thank uh, everyone involved in sums up and especially also my colleagues here at Ruprecht Consult because this was really a a team effort. But enough of the process and how we did this. I think you're probably most curious to see what is the result. Let's look at that. What does sustainable urban mobility planning mean today? What, how does an SEMP look like in 2019? And I would like to start by pointing out that in many ways, it looks the same as it did in 2013. The core concept of SEMP has stayed the same because as while technology is rapidly changing and we all are using mobile phones now or smartphones, we are in many ways still faced with the same challenges as we were six years ago or maybe even 20 years ago. There's traffic safety, air pollution, noise, there's a limited amount of space in cities, expanding cities, urban sprawl. We have congestion in many cities and an ever more mobile society where people are traveling longer and longer distances. So this has been key issues when we wrote the first edition of the SCMP guidelines. And I would argue they are still key issues today. If anything, they are more urgent today. So the core question of SCMP still is, in what kind of city do we want to live? And how do we get there? So SEMP is about a transformation process. It's about how to achieve the best quality of life and accessibility for all inhabitants in a city and its surrounding. And it is about organizing a change process that takes everyone on board, that takes the citizens on board, is transparent, 
motivates and explains. But to look at, to make it more concrete, let's look at the eight SUMP principles. They are still the essence of the concept and have been put even more to the forefront now in the new guidelines. The first principle is that the core goal is to improve accessibility and provide high quality, safe and clean mobility for the entire functional urban area. So this means that when you plan, you shouldn't only focus on the administrative borders of your city, but optimally you would focus on the real functional urban area, the commuting area where people actually move. The second principle is to cooperate across institutional boundaries. So SUMP means a lot of coordination and cooperation. Um, it's not about only doing planning by the experts in your own department, but rather having a, a lot of exchange with other departments and also beyond your organizations with other levels of government and transport providers, for example. Then the third principle is to involve citizens and stakeholders. So SEMP is transparent and participatory. Um, and these citizens and stakeholders should be actively involved, not only informed, which helps you to ensure also a high level of acceptance and support. So it's not only a burden, it really is also a benefit that helps you in the planning process. Then the fourth principle is to assess current and future performance. Um, there should be a thorough assessment, uh, fact-based planning, um, so that you can really plan for the main problems and opportunities in your city, including also future trends so that you are prepared for the changes that are happening at an ever more rapid pace. Then the fifth principle is to follow a long-term vision, but also to break it down into a clear implementation plan. So there should be a vision that has a lot of wide support uh, in, in the city society, but uh, you should also make this concrete and define measure packages that help you to achieve your vision, that specify also the timing, the budget, the responsibilities, so the operational side of planning. Then the sixth principle is to develop all transport modes in an integrated manner. And this is also a big challenge, of course, for cities in comparison to traditional planning where the public transport expert has done public transport and the uh, cycling expert has done cycling. And now we really have to think how to use these modes together and integrate them in the best way. And to achieve this, to not only focus on classical infrastructure measures, but to really use integrated sets of measures, also soft measures, also technical measures, promotional measures, and financial measures. Then the seventh principle is to monitor and evaluate closely. This both means to track the general progress to see is the city as a whole going in the right direction towards achieving your vision. And it also means monitoring the individual measures, which helps you to adjust them if they are off track and makes your planning activities more effective in general. And then finally, in all of this, of course, you should assure a high quality. Um, for those that know the old guidelines that might also know this table, so such a table has been included again in the new guidelines and has been also updated, but I don't have the time to explain it now. Um, instead, I would encourage you to look at it yourself because it makes some of these aspects, makes these principles even more concrete. Instead, I would like to focus a little bit more um, on the changes because while the core concept of SCMP, the main idea has stayed the same, the recommended process, how to put it into practice, has been updated and approved a lot. And this is maybe most notable in the new SUMP cycle. Here you see the version for decision makers, which gives a good overview over the entire process. So by following the guiding questions, the 12 guiding questions, one for each step, 
you can quickly get an idea of the overall flow of the planning process. As in the old guidelines, there are four phases in four different colors. We have preparation and analysis, then strategy development, then we have the measure planning, the operational side, and finally, of course, the implementation and monitoring. And in comparison to the first edition, uh, I would say that it has become a more balanced SUMP cycle. We have a more clear separation in the strategic planning stage, which is the first half of the cycle, and the operational stage, which is the second half of the cycle. This is also important because they often have different time logics, because while the strategic objectives are usually more stable, the measures are often updated very rap rapidly and sometimes even yearly. And another change is that there is more guidance for the operational side for the second half. So how to select measures, how to plan them in more detail, and then how to implement them. Um, a third change is that the four phases have three steps each now. So that's 12 steps instead of 11. So it's kind of a also more formal balance. And each of them ends with a milestone, which we have put more to the forefront. These milestones now are, each of them is described and they are also recommended as, as good anchor points of the process and super, suitable times where, for example, a political decision could be taken that uh, puts a solid ground for the next steps of the planning process. And that uh, decision maker cycle that you just saw works in combination with this more technical SCMP cycle for planners. The difference is that here you also have the 32 activities included um, for each of for the 12 steps. So um, this is kind of an anchor point as the guidelines. It also uh, forms the structure of a big part of the document, which you will see later. But of course, it can be a little bit overwhelming to look at it as a whole. And that's why I will go in deep in detail now and I will dive into the cycle and explain it step by step. So let's look in the first at the first phase, preparation and analysis. Here, really the groundwork for the planning process is done. It starts with the first milestone, decision to prepare an SEMP, um, which has been strengthened because this is really a very important basis for the entire rest of the, the planning process. Um, and we have strengthened it with some clear recommendations how to achieve a political commitment or what you could do as a planner if the general political situation in your city, for example, uh, is not in so much in favor of SUMP at the moment. Then we have the first step, set up working structures. So starting from the question, what are our resources, meaning human, institutional, financial, everything you need for planning, um, here the appropriate working and participation structures are set up. And here you see the four activities. I will not now, I will now not have the time to explain each of these activities, but as I said, you're you're very encouraged to look at the document itself. Instead, I will try to go through the entire cycle and and show and explain the general logic of the cycle instead. So the second step is to determine the planning framework. Um, and this is done very much in parallel to the first step. So the question is, what is our plan planning context? This means looking at the geographic scope of the plan, um, looking at what area you want to plan for, optimally the functional urban area. And you also ensure that the neighboring authorities and other departments are on board so that it is a really integrated process. And finally, then you agree on the planning timeline and recruit external support as needed. And once you have set up these structures in the first two steps, now you can start the planning process in a narrower sense. So you started with the analysis of the mobility situation. And here it is important to consider all transport modes um, and also the main sustainability aspects that are relevant to your city. 
meaning things such as air pollution, noise, road safety, livability, and, and equitable accessibility. And as a concluding milestone, after a good analysis, you should have achieved a, a solid idea of the major problems and opportunities in the entire functional urban area, which is a good foundation for the second phase, being strategy development. Here, the goal of the second phase is to define the strategic direction of the sustainable urban mobility. Based on the previous analysis, you're first looking at your general options for the future, um, taking into account likely changes in external factors. You develop scenarios that explore alternative strategic directions, um, which help you to then take, to have a better factual basis for the strategic decisions afterwards. Because in the next step, step five, you develop the vision and the objectives asking yourself the key question of a CMP, what kind of city do we want? And in order to not uh, achieve a vision that is only shared in the administration or in your organization, you sh should use visioning exercises with stakeholders and citizens to develop a shared understanding. Um, this common vision and the common objectives are really a cornerstone of every, every SUMP. Um, they describe the desired mobility for the future in a qualitative way, um, which is then specified with the concrete objectives that indicate the type of change you are aiming for. But in, able to, in order to be able to also measure success and put numbers on it, you are then in step six, uh, going to set targets and indicators. So strategic indicators that allow you to monitor progress without requiring unrealistic amounts of new data collection. And at the end of the second phase, you have then reached the milestone of a widely supported vision, objectives, and targets that hopefully are able to guide your measure planning stage and that uh, helps to give your entire planning activities a clear strategic direction and coordinates them. Now we are, oh yeah, and before I move to the next stage, I would uh, once more, I would highlight some of the changes. And this is also one of the changes in the new guidelines that we introduced some extra figures that hopefully make the sequence of activities even more clear. So for the second phase, for example, this figure is showing how the scenarios lead to the vision and objectives which then are uh, put into a more measurable form in the indicators and targets. With all of this in place, you are very well equipped to move to the operational side of planning. Um, and here, one of the key steps of SCMP and also one of the most uh, time consuming steps often is the measure pl planning, the measure uh, selection. So you ask yourself, what concretely will we do to achieve our vision and objectives? And in order to do it, you, um, you define integrated measure packages. Um, you then divide these measure packages into actions or actionable tasks, more, more detailed descriptions of what you're going to do. And most importantly, you also define the responsibilities and the financing side of it. I will explain this, uh, this third phase in a little bit more detail in a bit, but now I will first go through, through the st three steps in an overview. And then based on these two very important steps, step seven and step nine, as step seven and step eight, you are then able to uh, combine all the previous decisions and finalize an SUMP that combi combines both a long-term perspective, long-term vision, and a clear implementation plan. And as the most important milestone of the SUMP cycle, probably here, then the SUMP should be adopted by the relevant decision makers. But let's look at the measure planning steps in a little bit more detail because we worked a lot on them and we 
try to define a much clearer process of measure planning that really explains it step by step. So you would start by uh, defining a long list of measures, all the available options you have, all the available possibilities, looking very widely, then systematically assessing the effectiveness and the feasibility of the different measures, um, how much they contribute to your vision. This will then lead to a short list of measures, which is then integrated into measure packages. This means you combine measures that help each other. This could be different types of measures, soft and hard measures, or it could be by acceptability, for example, uh, defining popular and less popular measures, um, push and pull. So there's, there's different ways of measure packaging, but in general, it can help you to, to achieve your vision more effectively. Um, after a detailed assessment and also cost estimates, you validate the packages, you start into the action planning, defining it in more detail, uh, you identify possible funding sources, and with all of this information in place, you can really gather the important group of, of managers and decision makers in your municipality to take decisions on the priorities, on the responsibilities of the different projects. Um, afterwards, then you go, you can define uh, the financial side even in more detail, do also the budgets and finalize all of this in your SUMP. And we did not only define this process in more detail, but we really also tried to include a lot more hands-on tools, practical templates, different types of table or ways to assess, for example, the effectiveness of measures that, uh, that we hope are helping cities to, to actually do a systematic measure planning. And as you also already saw in that previous slide, um, there's much more focus on the financial aspects because this is, of course, the make and break of measure planning. If you don't have the money or you don't find a way to get the money for the measures, then they will not happen. So that's why we also much more clearly defined the different steps of, uh, of financing uh, throughout the measure planning. So, of course, you should take it in a, into account from the beginning. There is a rough cost estimation in the beginning. But then once you have defined and shortlisted and defined more clearly what you will probably do, then you invest in a more detailed cost, cost estimation, kicking out the measures that are unrealistic, but, uh, and making building a more solid foundation um, that will then allow you to identify the funding sources. And this means not only looking into your own municipal bu budget, but also of course, look wider external funding sources, financing mechanisms, uh, local taxes, and so on. And once you then have this defined uh, the final priorities and uh, the responsibilities, what will actually be done then, and often you do this yearly or every second year, you do the actual budgeting and you, you uh, earmark your funding for the different measures. So after doing all of these steps, um, you should then be very ready to go into the last phase, which is the implementation and monitoring phase, um, com accompanied by systematic evaluation and communication. So here again, we have three steps. Um, in the first step, the SUMP managers, they go a little bit more into the background because it's usually the responsible departments and organizations that will do the planning, the technical planning now. They do the procurement and the implementation. But as this involves a large amount of parties, it's important that somebody still keeps an overview and coordinates and, and checks if everything is going on track. And if not, is able to react in time. So monitoring and an active two-way dialogue with the public is important here. Um, which will allow you to, to take corrective action if needed and also to react, of course, to public concerns. And then in the very end, you're asking yourself, so what have we learned? And what can we learn for the next uh, cycle of SEMP? Because um, the final milestone of the SEMP cycle 
measure, implementation, evaluate. It does conclude the SCMP cycle, but it only leads on to the next cycle because this is very much a cyclical process or hopefully kind of a spiral that spirals up and continually improves urban mobility in your city. So this was a tour de force around the SEMP cycle. I hope you are still following me. And I promise that the rest of the presentation will be less technical. But I also hope that you're not tired yet of cycles because we have used this, this idea of a cycle as the common visual element that holds the SEMP guidelines together. For example, we created three versions for important horizontal topics for citizen involvement, for the political decision making and for monitoring and evaluation. These figures, they are supposed to give you an overview where in the process these aspects are most important. And let's look, uh, let's take a look at one of them. This is the one for citizen involvement. While you should have the citizens in mind from day one, it's not necessarily useful to involve them all the time because this could make them tired. Um, instead, we recommend that it's better to do high quality activities a few times that really reaches a wide variety of citizens and that gives them a positive experience rather than trying to do it all the time, but then maybe having the quality suffer. And this cycle suggests at which points it could be most useful to involve the citizens, citizens and it recommends what exactly you could do. Um, to make this more concrete, this is then combined with suggested methods, um, an explanatory box with the main messages. There is a definition, what is a stakeholder, what is a citizen, what is the difference? And of course, different good practice examples and different uh, processes, how you could involve the citizens. Um, this is all from activity 1.4 to plan stakeholder and citizen involvement. And together these elements form a package that hopefully helps planners to decide when and how much citizen involvement fits the need. Um, you do not have to look at them in detail now. Again, uh, feel free or feel encouraged to look at the guidelines themselves. Instead, I would like to move on to the next um, aspect that is a very important change in my opinion, it's, which is that we have emphasized the flexibility of the SEMP process. We know that the SEMP cycle represents the ideal order of steps in activities, but in reality, it will differ from city to city, of course, and that is something we wanted to emphasize with this figure, but also by including an entire chapter on planning and practice. Um, the steps, they will take different amounts of time, which is symbolized here by the size of the circles. So the, this, the cycle is the same with the same colors as before and the same 12 steps, but the different size of the bubbles shows how much time the different steps could take. And the arrows show that it's very normal that you will have feedback mechanisms, of course. So often you need to go back and change the results of previous steps. In measure planning, for example, you usually go back and reassess your options based on political decisions and funding opportunities later on. And in implementation, anyways, it's a constant back and forth between monitoring and adjusting measures. So we, we know that every SMP process is different and that's why we focused on working out a concept that is flexible and that is adaptable by practitioners to their realities. And once more, I would like to emphasize the eight SMP principles here because they give a good anchor. While the process is very flexible, the eight principles, they should be respected. Well, after all this input, let's look at the document itself, at the way it is structured, at the main elements, and at how it hopefully helps you to navigate this quite complex, complex process of planning. Um, of course, here are a few numbers. Um, it includes all the elements of the SEMP cycle that I mentioned earlier. 
the principles, the phases, the milestones, steps and activities. And it is a quite comprehensive document. So there's 165 pages of hard work um, from more than 100 contributors. And I know that this might seem like a lot of reading material, but it's not a document that you need to read from cover to cover from the first to the last page. Instead, it's, it's meant for being opened in the middle and then just reading the parts that interest you in this very moment. And as the process to prepare and develop an SCMP usually takes at least a year or longer, and then including measure implementation and so on several years, this is usually how a planner, a reader would, would use the document. Um, whenever approaching a certain part of the cycle of the planning process, they can open it and get advice or ideas, suggestions, what could be useful in this part of the planning process. So let's look at the structure of the document to explain what I mean with helping you to open it in the middle. So the colors, I think, are very important. The, um, there's two main sections. The first section is, is basically an introduction to SUMP, like I did in the beginning. It explains the concept, the benefits of SUMP, um, the main elements and how to adapt it to the national context. And then um, there's this, the main part is the second section, which is oriented after the cycle and the four phases with the four colors. And in these phases, each of the activities then has the same structure. So whichever activity you open, you will always see um, the same structure of rationale, aims, tasks, and a checklist. So to give an example, this is activity 6.1, set indicators for all objectives. Um, the rationale gives you an overview how this activity fits into the wider planning process. Then the aims, they define the general goals, while the tasks, they describe more the concrete steps that you would do, with written in a, in a clear active language, not making it overly complicated. And then finally, the checklist, it helps you, it summarizes what you want to achieve here and helps you not to forget anything. And in addition to these elements, there are, each activity also contains boxes for tools, boxes for good practice examples, and sometimes boxes with additional information. Uh, for this example, you can see a definition explaining what an indicator is on the bottom. And on the second page of the activity, you see help, a box with helpful tools to select the right indicators and two good practice examples in this case from Milton Keynes and Malmö. And as you probably noticed, another big change in the new guidelines is the upgraded, more user-friendly design. So I'd say it's not only a generally more modern and clean design, but also by having the tools and city examples as separate boxes, always in the same design, it becomes quite easy to just thumb through the document and quickly find what you're searching for. Um, and then as the last big change that I would emphasize is are the 62 new city examples, which are in my opinion, also one of the biggest improvements in the second edition. They make the document very practical and very applied um, comparing them to the first edition, which of course also a lot of, had a lot of good practice examples, they now have a more clear structure, always with a context, description, then the lessons learned, and also the required costs and know-how. So this is hopefully making it easier for you to understand, is this an example that could also be helpful in my city, or is my context so different that this will not help me? And they are much more focused on the specific planning activity that they are a good practice for. So they are not describing the entire SUMP process in that city. They always try to focus very much on this one aspect and this one activity. Um, and here I'd like to thank also the four city networks that have been very important in, in gathering all these uh, and collecting all these examples. So, uh, a shout out to ICLEI, UBC, Eurocities, and Polis. 
And of course, most importantly, the cities themselves who have shared and described their activity, activities. Um, maybe some of you are in the audience today. Um, and I think because I might be running out of time, I will go very quickly through this. So of course, there's a lot of more information out there that complements the guidelines. And I would only like to highlight that there is an online version of the guidelines being put on Altus at the moment, and that will be with links and hyperlinks so that you can click around in the document even easier. And then very soon, there's also a new SCMP self-assessment that is also very closely linked with the new guidelines. And of course, the topic guides that we will hear more about in a minute. So to sum up, um, change takes time and very active planning. And the SUMP concept and the new SUMP guidelines are a good tool to manage and to bring about this change in your city. They are freshly updated to the new trends and planning realities. They have a stable concept of eight clear SUMP principles at the core and a flexible process that provides a good structure, but leaves enough room to be adapted to the specific circumstances in each city and country. It is a concept that has been proven and tested in several hundred European cities, the lessons of which have been captured in this second edition of the SMP guidelines. Lastly, I would argue that it is also a concept that very much fits our times where where ch change is needed, ever more urgent to tackle, for example, the climate crisis, but where change is also getting ever more complex in a rapidly changing world. With this, I would like to thank you all for listening, and I would like to thank everyone involved in the development of the, of the SUMP guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Lasse, for the very comprehensive overview it was really nice that you really emphasize what has been changed, but what are still the remaining principles. And one of the principles that you mentioned is that you need to plan mobility for the functional urban area. And next we will move to metropolitan areas that definitely have like their own challenges and maybe need a bit specific approach as well. So I will give the floor to Mathilde. Yes, thank you, Maya. Can you put your webcam on as well? Yes, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, now we can. Okay, perfect. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maya, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Matilde Kinellato, and I'm Mobility Project Coordinator at EuroCities. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to give you this presentation on this new SUM topic guide that, as have you heard, is part of this set of new topic guides that were developed next to the uh, second edition of the new um, SUM guidelines. Uh, the Metropolitan Regions um, Guide uh, was developed uh, by Eurocities, so I was the person in charge of it uh, in cooperation with the reform project but also and especially uh, thanks to the uh, experience of many metropolitan regions that have uh, shared their knowledge uh, with us. The new topic guide uh, for metropolitan regions has the aim to uh, basically support, uh, as you can easily imagine, uh, urban mobility planning and metropolitan scale, so a precise type of functional urban area. <clears throat> But we wanted to do that by providing a common definition, um, examples rather than pres prescriptive uh, steps, um, rather guiding principles that could guide indeed um, a metropolitan um, uh, planning uh, throughout the different uh, steps of the SAM cycle. But also we wanted to make sure that we were respecting the uh, variety of um, and the diversity of metropolitan uh, contexts across Europe, the different institutional setups and governance structures. 
But let me start with the basics. So what do we mean by metropolitan region? What do we uh, define as a metropolitan region? So in this specific guide, we have used a definition that is offered by OECD together with Eurostat and uh, defines the metropolitan region as uh, a contiguous, uh, high dense and built up uh, functional urban area, which has at least 250,000 inhabitants. According to this definition, um, and according to OECD, there are uh, 28 uh, capital city metropolitan regions in Europe and even more, um, 250 almost other metropolitan regions in Europe. They overall represent almost 60% of the EU population, which is more than half, uh, and also uh, around 60% of the EU jobs. Um, and 70 almost percent of the uh, GDP at European level. So we immediately understand the economic uh, power, the economic attractiveness of these metropolitan regions, uh, the number of jobs that they, um, that they create, that they offer. And we also uh, imagine right immediately the um, magnitude of the commuting flows that go into and from the core of these metropolitan regions. We also understand that they are um, those places where all the different uh, transport modes come together in a complex multimodal uh, system and that they uh, often uh, or very often I would say are uh, nodes of um, uh, transport nodes of national or European even importance <clears throat> at the crossroad of transport corridors. But we also um, saw since the very beginning of this process of drafting the Metropolitan Regions Guide that uh, metropolitan regions in Europe are very diverse. And uh, one of the main uh, characteristics um, that we immediately spotted was a variety of governance models. And we used in the guide this classification that is from, again, the OECD which um, we don't have to intend as a very strict categorization, uh, meaning that some metropolitan regions might be more in one category, but they can still have some features of the others and vice versa. So we have to intend this classification rather as um, an indication of, um, of uh, what kind of um, metropolitan region is more similar to, to our single cases. Um, just to give you a short um, explanation of what they are, <clears throat> we saw those three main types. Um, the informal or soft co cooperation uh, type of uh, governance model at metropolitan level um, is basically um, um, a platform, I would say, a type of coordination where all the different municipalities that are part of this metropolitan region share um, the same weight. They have all the same importance and they share um, cooperation in an informal way. When it comes to some development, there might be a leading authority leading on the SAMP development process, uh, but still the um, authority to develop a SAMP is retained by the single municipalities that are part of this cooperation scheme. When it comes to intermunicipal structures, those are rather formal official structures. They have a clear uh, platform, clear mechanisms, and even a clear decision-making process. Uh, here, the municipalities share costs and responsibilities. And the structure, this intermunicipal structure, is often the one that has the leading, um, the, the lead in developing the SAMP uh, for the whole metropolitan region. However, here, the um, decisions are always taken in constant agreement um, uh, among the different municipalities that compose the, um, the, the intermunicipal structure. And when it comes to um, imposing, let's say, the uh, implementation of the measures uh, uh, included in the SAMP, uh, here we understand that inter intermunicipal structure don't have a strong enough or um, an effective uh, such uh, power to impose that to all the municipalities. 
The third type of governance um, is the supramunicipal uh, authorities. Here, there is a clear um, appointment, a clear allocation of responsibilities to an authority that is above all the municipalities that are part of the metropolitan region. So here, there is a clear hierarchical structure and the uh, leading authority is the one who has the mandate to develop a SAMP and to monitor the implementation of, uh, of the SAMP itself. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a more concrete idea of what those different uh, governance models are, I've uh, proposed some example one uh, per uh, type of governance model, um, which are also included in the guide. The first one that I picked is uh, an example from the region of Central Macedonia in Greece. Um, so in Greece there are no metropolitan authorities as such, but the region of Central Macedonia has developed uh, a sort of soft cooperation scheme uh, for some development, which uh, takes the form of a competence center and an observatory for sustainable mobility, um, which uh, intend to support technically uh, the SAMP development, the implementation, the monitoring of the SAMP that are being developed at local level by the different municipalities that are part of the Thessaloniki area. Um, and at the same time, this uh, Sustainable uh, Urban Mobility Observatory has the um, mandate to collect the data, gather the data and to analyze it so that um, this is used to complement the different SAMs that are being developed at local level into um, complementary uh, documents for the metropolitan area. And this will also serve in the future as a basis for developing a metropolitan sump for the area of Thessaloniki. The second example um, for the <clears throat> intermunicipal uh, type of um, uh, structure of governance model uh, comes from the metropolitan region of Oslo. In this case, uh, the metropolitan region of Oslo is composed by the city of Oslo itself and by the uh, Akershus County. Those two are two different entities, legal entities. They, they're, they're not formally together, but they have a very established, a very clear framework. They work um, uh, within, they, they, they work on transport um, uh, and, and land use as well, as you will see. And this clear um, framework uh, is rooted into three uh, clear pillars. On one side, we have what is called the Oslo package, which is <clears throat> a long-term transport investment program for, um, indeed, as you can understand, for the um, uh, developing the transport offer across the metropolitan region of Oslo, which is financed through uh, the revenues of the toll ring system that is uh, across the city of Oslo. The second pillar uh, is this uh, joint venture public transport organization, which has uh, strategic, uh, but also funding and operational capacity um, across the whole uh, metropolitan region. And then the third pillar is the regional plan that is uh, that was developed in 2015 and which has, and which has, I don't see my presentation anymore, just a second, which has the um, um, set the basis, let, let's say, uh, for transport development and for land use um, for the whole metropolitan uh, region and has a legal, uh, is a legal framework as well. Okay. The third example is then from the uh, third uh, category, so the supra municipal. Uh, type of governance <clears throat> and comes from uh, Greater Manchester. So um, Greater Manchester is uh, governed by the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, which is uh, composed by 10 indirectly elected members from the 10 districts that are part of the Greater Manchester region, plus a directly elected mayor for the whole uh, metropolitan region. 
the transfer policy is then um, delivered by the Transport for Greater Manchester organization, which is a non-for-profit organization, and it's basically the operational arm of the uh, Greater, Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Um, this was introduced around uh, 2011 uh, after um, reformation of the um, local government <clears throat> laws. And uh, since then, uh, the uh, Transport for Greater Manchester in 2015 uh, started the process of developing the SAMP for the whole metropolitan region. And this is the first example of this kind uh, where um, the process is uh, mainstreamed and centralized at a uh, metropolitan region level. Those are just uh, three examples that I've included here just to make it a bit more concrete um, about this difference uh, in the variety of governance settings uh, in metropolitan regions in Europe. Uh, but of course, the, um, the guide, uh, the topic guide goes through um, a number of other examples that are not just related to the um, governance settings, but also providing support based on these differences um, throughout the different steps of the, uh, of the SAMP cycle. So here is just an overview of what, um, how the topic guide uh, look like. You will always find the reference to the SAMP cycle, so where we are, in which phase of the SAMP cycle, as we've seen earlier uh, from LASSE. Um, you will find more detailed uh, description and um, <clears throat> examples based on the experience of metropolitan regions for each subtask, each substep of uh, of the cycle, but you will also find concrete good uh, practices examples in boxes um, that you can uh, read also um, um, uh, by just opening uh, the guide, as Lasse was saying. So even if it's not if you're not interested in the whole description of the of the single step. And uh, just be uh, aware that there is also an annex where we have collected all the good practices that are included in the main document, but in full length. And here you will always find the uh, different examples grouped by governance model, because we thought it was important and maybe easier for a, a, a user, for a reader, to immediately spot those kind of examples that are more similar to their specific case. You will always find a description of the metropolitan region um, uh, that is object of the, um, of the good practice examples. You will find, in some cases, different examples for the same metropolitan region. And for each uh, single example, you will find always a box um, pointing out the benefits of such an approach, of such a, a good practice, and also um, summarize there the um, steps or the things, the checklist that you have to make sure um, you follow to uh, replicate that uh, good practice. So here again, as it was mentioned in the previous presentation, the two, uh, the guide and the annex are available on the LTS website. Here I've always um, also provided the, um, the links, but in any case, they're on LTS and you can find them. And I hope you will find them interesting and you will find some examples that could uh, facilitate or ease uh, the work um, that you uh, are doing. Uh, back home. So thank you very much. That was a short presentation from my side. But I'm also available for further questions in case you have any. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> thank you, Mathilde, for the overview. And we will. Somebody was asking, and we will share all the presentations with you after the webinar. But thanks for the good overview. And then just to mention that SAMSAP will also develop these kind of guidelines for small and medium sized cities and they will be published in the end of this year or in the beginning of next year, but those will be coming. Uh, but next we will move to the one of sort of new kind of topics, well not new anymore, but topic that cities need to take into account more in their SUMB process.
more and more all the time. So the electrification and the second topic guide that some sub projects has produced. So the floor is yours, Toma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Mouret. I work for Polis, Network of Cities and Regions. And uh, as uh, as it was presented before, uh, Sums Up um, pre uh, produced uh, several topic guides, uh, some topic guides. And um, my organization and, and I was uh, working on the production of this guide on the electrification of uh, of uh, road transport in uh, in the sub context, so uh, I will um, I will present you now um, quite quickly, but uh, I will try to to give you some examples of um, of what is included in this guide and uh, what is the um, the actual uh, uh, content of the guide. So uh, first of all, why this guide? Uh, we saw in the last uh, years um, that uh, el electric mobility. Uh, was a, a technology that was um, more and more implemented in cities for uh, individual vehicles, but also for uh, urban freight vehicles, for public transport vehicles like buses, and also for other type of, uh, of vehicles like um, car sharing, bike sharing, uh, and no scooter sharing. So um, this is something that is more and more uh, present in cities, but there are also a lot of uncertainties and, and challenges about it. And uh, these uh, challenges were not uh, covered in a specific SUM guide uh, so far. So uh, we thought it was um, important to cover it in, in one of the, of the topic guides um, because there are some uh, planning challenges that are uh, very much related to this uh, specific uh, topic of um, electrification of, uh, of uh, urban transport. Um, like, for instance, uh, the charging infrastructure. So, um, how, where to, to uh, install them in the city, uh, how to operate them, who, who, will, uh, who is uh, in charge of the operation and the management of such infrastructure, and so on. Uh, also, uh, you, for cities, it's a, a new um, network of stakeholders to, to, to deal with. Um, for SUMP, cities are used to work with, um, let's say, the mobility ecosystem. But now there is also the um, energy ecosystem to, to deal with. Um, and also we, we, we focused on, on this guide because we thought that uh, electric mobility is also a um, type of mobility that is quite uh, adapted to the urban and suburban context in general with uh, relative short distances and the possibility to implement uh, a dense network of charging points. So, um, and, and finally, I, I wanted to uh, say that this this guide is um, is on electric mobility because, as I said before, um, this is something that we see is uh, coming up and is uh, developing quite quickly in cities. But we we acknowledge that uh, the ele electric mobility is not the only uh, alternative uh, fuel, and other and hopefully other guides on other type of fuels will uh, will be um, produced soon and complement this guide. So um, now the objective of the guide, um, it was really to, to guide mobility planning authorities, so uh, cities and regions, in uh, the process of the uh, electrification of uh, road transport and how this, um, this can um, adapt to the eight main SUMP principles that Lasse presented before and how this can be integrated in the different SUMP uh, steps. Um, and uh, on the contrary, this this is not supposed to be a technical guide for the actual uh, deployment of uh, alternative fuels infrastructure, for instance. So the idea is really to uh, connect uh, or to, to make the connection between uh, electric mobility and uh, sustainable urban mobility planning. So uh, what is in, in this guide? So um, I will now quickly show you the, the or explain to you what are the different um, um, big sections in this guide. So, of course, we start with a, an introduction where we um, explain why um, electric mobility, what are the advantages of, of uh, electric mobility. Then we um, use the uh, eight SUMP principles to, to raise uh, some questions on how electric mobility can, can adapt 
to these uh, to these topics, like for instance, how um, institutional cooperation or citizens' involvement um, are impact or how to adapt to these uh, to these principles from the angle of uh, the electrification of uh, of um, urban mobility. Then uh, we we go through the SUMP cycle. And we, we try to uh, highlight uh, some of the, the key steps for, for the electrification of, uh, of transport. And also um, in this part, we also uh, include some specific paragraphs on, uh, on planning for charging infrastructure, which is something quite uh, specific um, in this guide. And finally, we have um, uh, two sections with uh, some um, sets of uh, recommendations or guidance. Uh, the first one is on uh, transport sector specific recommendations where we um, cover uh, public transport, urban freight, uh, shared mobility and private mobility. And the second one is uh, about um, supporting policy measures like uh, urban vehicle access restriction, parking, uh, funding and financing, procurement and uh, incentives of, and promotion. And all these chapters are um, are uh, complemented by uh, by some um, some uh, city example examples from cities, examples from um, from other uh, some guides, and also reference to references to uh, EU directives. And so now I will go uh, through um, through through all of these uh, parts quite quickly and giving some examples. So the first part is is the the introduction, so the approach. So our starting point uh, was to say that uh, cities are facing some problems related with uh, the urban traffic. And um, among these problems are uh, the emissions of pollutants of greenhouse gases and noise. And that these, no these um, emissions are um, for a large part produced by the, the vehicles engines. Um, and these uh, emissions have um, quite negative impacts uh, at the local level on the health of citizens, on the environment, but also on, at the global level on the, on the climate change. Um, and um, to, to, have a, to, to try to uh, mitigate these effects, uh, cities have uh, several solutions at hand to, to try to, to reduce these emissions. One, of course, is to, to go for a modal shift and uh, to, um, to, um, to, uh, put, to, to, to go away from the, um, the car-centric city to uh, um, a mobility pattern where uh, more people are more walking, cycling, using uh, public transport and also shared mobility options. And this can also be of course, this is one part of the solution, but another part of the solution is to make sure that all the vehicles that are still uh, operating in the cities uh, are emitting less, uh, meaning that um, uh, in, this, in this sense, uh, electric mobility can play a major role because uh, electric uh, vehicles are um, potentially zero emission vehicles, uh, at least locally. So. Um, they, they can uh, play an important role in this uh, in this context. So uh, we see uh, electric mobility as a tool to to reduce those emissions, and also as a tool that must be combined with other solutions, uh, not as a single objective. And um, because there is a, a link uh, with other sustainable mobility components um, and how this should be integrated in an overall strategy for mobility. Uh, we think it must be part of the uh, SUMP uh, plan, um, process. So um, that was the introduction, and now I will uh, show you very quickly how it um, it relates to the SUMP principles. So you can read uh, on this slide the eight SUMP principles. I've tried to um, highlight uh, our work with uh, two of them. So. Uh, involving citizens and relevant stakeholders and cooperating across institutional boundaries. So um, first we raise a, a number of questions here. I've made a, a short selection and I will show you how uh, we um, try to give answers to those questions. So the first question is, for instance, which institutions and departments must be involved in electric mobility planning? And here we, as I said in my introduction, we really um, insist on the fact that um, 
the, the role of the of the municipality or the planning authority in the SUMP process is to make sure that the two kind of words that were uh, apart before, so the mobility world and the energy world are um, uh, meeting and that they talk together and that they, they can plan together because it's very important to involve, for instance, uh, beyond the mobility um, uh, ecosystem, let's say. It's also important to involve uh, actors such as uh, the energy department of the municipality, energy producers, grid operators, charging infrastructure operators, and so on. Um, another question is how do institutional structures and in local and regional authorities need to change to address planning uh, for electric mobility? And what are the most adapted cooperation methods or frameworks? And here, um, again, uh, we stress uh, the importance of, uh, of um, involving the uh, energy departments or the energy agencies in the, in the municipalities. And then how, which methods, which uh, frameworks do you use? Uh, we don't think that there is a single solution that, uh, that, that can be uh, applied in all cities, but we present a variety of, of solutions that can be, that can be taken. Uh, one is to uh, include um, a representative of the energy department uh, in, the, in the municipal team that, that is working on the SUMP. Another solution could be to have regular uh, meetings with, uh, P with the energy department, can be weekly, monthly, bi-monthly. Um, or uh, another, another um, option is to cooperate within um, an e-mobility platform or to work together on an on a e-mobility strategy and have a co-ownership uh, so between the mobility department and the energy department on this platform or strategy. And here we take the, the example of, of Barcelona, which has uh, such an electric mobility strategy, um, which is actually a complement to the SUMP and which is not something in addition, but more a complement or an annex to it. And uh, which uh, also helps to, to identify and to put together all the e-mobility measures uh, and, and make a, a clear reference to the uh, local SUMP and, and how this contribute to reaching the SUMP goals. Uh, a third question that I will take as an example is how can cities facilitate organize, uh, facilitate, organize a participatory dialogue about a topic with, uh, with uncertainties and, a low and low levels of awareness? Um, here, uh, again, we, we uh, advise to use the, um, the development of an e-mobility strategy. So you can easily um, put, bring together all the stakeholders that needs to be involved and also uh, that gives them a, a feeling of ownership on the strategy and the measures. And it's also uh, a framework where you can uh, more easily uh, discuss of uh, the allocation of responsibilities, the timing and so on, uh, rather than uh, at the um, general SUMP level, which is um, uh, involving more stakeholders and which is maybe more complex. Um, and of course, it's important to do it throughout the, the entire uh, SUMP cycle. Uh, I will now skip this slide because I, I see we, we are um, already quite late in the, in the webinar. Um, now, um, just an example of how we we did um, we treated the, the different um, sector-related recommendations. Here, I've taken the example of uh, urban freight. So, um, why urban freight? Uh, because this is, um, although they represent a small um, uh, portion of the of the number of vehicles that are running in the cities, they contribute for a larger large share of the traffic emissions. Um, and uh, cities or municipalities or planning authorities have a direct and or uh, indirect influence on uh, on these um, on these um, vehicles, uh, and they can take uh, measures to to try to accelerate the uh, electrification of these uh, fleets. So examples of uh, of measures that are regulations that can be taken by uh, um, planning authorities are economic and financial advantages, like for instance, uh, granting free parking for for electric um, vans or trucks. Also regular regulatory measures, 
like um, allowing longer unloading time windows for loading or unloading time windows for electric uh, the drivers of electric uh, vans or electric trucks compared to um, conventional uh, vehicles. Um, also, cities have the possibility to uh, provide some charging infrastructure. Uh, fast charging infrastructure for these for these um, operators, um, which can help them um, during the day to recharge their vehicles in case their uh, range is not um, big enough for for daily operation. And finally, cities can also lead by examples. They can um, first uh, decide to electrify their own uh, fleets, um, like for instance the waste collection trucks. And, uh, and also uh, via the, um, the procurement of, uh, of, of, um, of different services, uh, they can go for, for zero emission uh, deliveries, um, require it um, as part of their uh, procurement strategy. Uh, and here we take um, the example of, of uh, the city of Oslo uh, in the project BIZET. And for the rest, we also uh, um, use examples uh, from the project Freeview, which you can, uh, you can see on the slide. And finally, uh, the last uh, section of the guide is about um, um, combining uh, policy, other policy measures uh, that can uh, reinforce uh, the electrification of transport and vice versa. And here we have uh, made a link with other SUMP topic guides that were uh, published um, together with this one. And uh, among the, th the themes that we, um, we cover are urban vehicle access restriction, parking, funding and financing and uh, public procurement. So you can find all the guides uh, online. Um, you can also find this, uh, this guide on the electrification of, uh, of uh, road transport uh, on the LTS platform, as Mathilde just uh, mentioned. Uh, here is the um, direct link to, to, this, uh, to this guide. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them during this webinar or to contact me. Um, via this uh, email address and of course uh, I wanted to also thank uh, the my colleagues at Ruprecht Consult who uh, co um, drafted this guide so Wolfgang and Henning and also all the um, cities uh, stakeholders and the European Commission that um, provided um, um, contribution for this guide so thank you very much okay thank you Thomas for your presentation. So now we will move to the questions and answer session. And I would like to all the presenters to share their webcam so that we can still see you. Uh, but I would like to start with Lasse as, as this SUMB cycle might seem quite overwhelming as you said. So what, what kind of tip would you give to a city who is starting the SUMB process that where, where to really start? Okay, I was muted. Uh, could you repeat again? So where to really start? Yeah, that because the SUMB cycle with a lot of different steps and activities might seem quite overwhelming. So what would you recommend to a city who has not prepared SUMB yet that where to start the process? Yeah, I think the first uh, milestone is definitely you should look at that one at that page because that is about this tricky question of how to to get a decision how to get enough kind of political power also behind sustainable urban mobility and what you could do how you could sell the idea of sustainable urban mobility also to people who are who are not yet convinced or who who don't really see the the benefit for the city so I think that is an important aspect. And then, of course, I think a common vision is really a key element. So, and that doesn't have to be very complicated, but it can be just to gather the right people in your administration and to discuss urban mobility, to also discuss how urban mobility is affecting other areas, not only mobility, but energy and urban planning and all the other issues and so that to make colleagues interested um, and then to try to forge a common vision and to to promote that vision and maybe the third aspect i would like to highlight is this this institutional cooperation aspect so there is 
very practical uh, methods you could use to to try to improve your cooperation with colleagues and um, yeah the upcoming SCMP self-assessment will give very clear recommendations also for for the different types of cities so when you score there and you for example score relatively low on on institutional cooperation then it gives you a concrete advice what type of workshop you could do with your colleagues to to make them interested to get involved in urban mobility but it's okay. difficult to say where to start it depends so much on your situation yeah thanks for the answer then we have another question so the question is that how the monitoring and evaluation part has changed that the the person who asked the question said that that he's looking at this from a research perspective and would like to learn more about how you monitor exogenous effects during a SUMP cycle and if there is a way also to evaluate the potential impact of emerging innovative technologies to support the objectives of, of an SUMP. Um, well in general I would say monitoring and evaluation hasn't changed that much in the new guidelines but we try to emphasize more how to achieve a realistic approach so not too many indicators but rather choose the right ones so that you are actually able afterwards also to to monitor them um, of course also the possibilities for data collection digital data collection have increased and we highlighted those in in activity 3.1 so in the analysis part we we also gave examples how you could use them how you could map for example the problems together with the citizens online and so on um, but the exogenous effects are of course a tricky question and well cities in practice they don't keep to because you said you are looking at this from a scientific perspective usually would not be able to keep scientific standards to to very clearly define what's what's exogenous and what is due to your own activities but we encourage the cities to do also service and interviews after measure implementation to understand the motivations and reasons for change and then you could could get a better idea did your measure really help or was it just a general technological development and then for your question on on the new mobility trends i would encourage you to look at another topic guide which is about shared mobility and there it uh, it looks at the effects of these new trends in much more detail than i could explain now and that one is also available on altus okay and then we also had a question that is it possible to get a word version of the SEMB guide so that it could be translated to national languages um, yes, in general, it is possible. I would encourage you to send me an email, um, l.brand at ruprecht-consult.eu. Um, and then we can see what the process is. So there is discussions for translations in different languages, and we try to ensure that there is one official translation per language or country, and that it keeps a good quality, of course. Um, but in general, we are very uh, uh, helpful and we are very thankful for interest to get it translated or to maybe be the person that does the quality review after a professional translator did the translation. So please send me an email. Okay, and then there is still a question that uh, what is the relationship between SUMB and SULPs? Is that sustainable urban logistic plan? and yeah. can they be aligned of course they can and should be aligned um, yeah again i think i would like to forward you to that topic guide that is specifically specifically on sustainable urban logistics plans um, i think this is a very important topic because freight is too little focused on in many SUMPs, but it has very strong effects especially now with the the internet shopping and the parcel delivery. So I really think this is important to align them. Okay, good. Then we have another question that I would like to ask if there are some guidelines about how to set up the team related to the areas of SUMB. Is there a recommended team size or a recommendation on task management for the team? 
So how to really practically organize? Yeah, there is recommendations. I can't give you a specific team size now because it also varies too much also on the size of the city, for example. But in the, the first two steps, step one and two of the cycle, there you find a lot of uh, guidance on how to set up the team. There is, for example, a table that shows you which type of knowledge and competences should be in the team. And that will help you to select who should be in there, for example. Okay, thanks. Um, but we are running out of time now. So we will end the question and answer section here. But before we end, I would like to remind you that we still have like two upcoming webinars coming and it's possible to register for those in the sums up website slash events. So the next topic will be the integration of SUMBs in the urban planning and climate work and especially the setups. And then the last one will be about financing and funding options for sustainable urban mobility. And then we will also present one of the topic guides that we have prepared in sums up. And I would also like to remind you that we are we have these e-learning courses online. We already have three courses on different SUMB phases online, which can be found from the mobilityacademy.eu. And we will launch also in this autumn more e-courses. And these are free of charge and can be taken any, any time you wish. But I would like to thank all the presenters for the presentations and we will, as I said, we will share those with you and this webinar has been recorded as well. So the recording will be available soon in our website. And thanks also for all the participants and see you in the next webinar.